Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to the Pupillage Fair. It's a pleasure to be speaking to all the future barristers of the bar. My name is Hilary Lennox, and I am a barrister at Five St Andrew's Hill Chambers. And this is? My name is Lachlan <laughs> Wilson, and I'm a barrister at uh, Three Paper Buildings. But uh, more recently, we called ourselves and styled ourselves 3PB Barristers, as if to affect some form of modernization. <laughs> okay, so the areas I practice in is international family law, crime, uh, extradition and human rights. Um, Five St Andrews Hill has a growing and very active family law team and we practice ab across the entire spectrum of family law. So that means we do children, we do ancillary relief, we do public, which is care, um, and anything else, can't remember. So in terms of what type of cases I do, for example, last week was quite a busy week for me. Um, Monday I was doing child relocation, so that's international family law, arguing um, jurisdiction between the UK and Tanzania. Um, and that means that which country gets to argue the case. Tuesday I was in the extradition courts um, arguing um, Article 8 human rights issues. Wednesday I was doing finance um, in another court, so a divorce finance, breaking up the um, the family home, the pensions, etc., deciding where, what, and who it goes to, etc. Um, Thursday, I was doing a child arrangement case, which means it's who the children spend time with, where they get to live, and with whom. And then Friday, I was doing an occupation order, and unusually, it was where a husband who had left the property after 15 months wanted to come back into the family home. So that was just the last week, and you're. <laughs> Your weeks don't have to be that busy. They can be as busy as you want them to be, but I'm saying this in terms of the broad spectrum my chambers does and what you can be expected to be doing at the bar and particularly by way of family law. So in terms of um, care cases and public law cases, they generally take place in all the courts, the district courts, the circuit courts, and also the high court. And that involves cases where um, children are being taken into care. So our chambers would represent the local authorities who make these applications. We would also then represent either mother, either father, the guardian who represents the children in these cases and the children's best interests, and then also the Met Police, because if there's outstanding criminal disclosures, etc you will want to try and disclose that and bring it into the proceedings so that the courts and the judges can make an informed decision in terms of the background of the parties. So that's a public law type case, that's care cases, and they're really common over here, there's loads of them, and that's just where the care or parental responsibility is taken away from the parents and the local authorities now have parental responsibility, and that means that they can decide where they're going to be educated, what their religion is going to be, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of um, child arrangement, what does that mean? That's what um, who the children are going to spend time with, and that's always a row. That comes under private law um, children, and or Section 8 applications, and Section 8 just means the Section 8 of the Children Act 1989. Now, child arrangement has had a huge reform over the last few years, and it's called the Child Arrangement Programme 2014, and that essentially sets out that you'll, you'll hear about residents, you'll hear about contact, they're old-fashioned words now, it's who the child spends time with and who the child lives with. And that just means you decide if, if, the, if it's a really hostile environment, then Kafka become involved and that's they are the voice of the child so the child children get interviewed by Kafka who is an independent kind of social services and then they draft a report and they go back into the courts and tell the court what their views are independent views then another type of case um, I was mentioning there was child relocation and the Hague Convention now London is such a diverse city, it's a very exciting city and people come from all walks of life. So where does child relocation come in? It's when, for example, parties divorce 
And one part, he says, um, you know what? I want to go home. I want to go home to my own family. I want to be back with my parents. Except that family lives in Australia or that family lives in the US or somewhere. And then the husband or the wife, whatever, lives here in the UK. So what do you do? And that's happening an awful lot because, as you can imagine, parties are from such different areas. Another one then would be the Hague Convention. And that's if the court, let's say, refuses the child relocation. And one of the parents says, well, stuff this, I'm going home anyway. And they do go home and they take the children. That's called child abduction. And if the country is a signatory to the Hague Convention, then um, they'll have to be sent back and the UK courts will have to determine habitual residence and determine who gets jurisdiction, et cetera, et cetera. So those are different types of family areas and family work um, our chambers does. Um, in terms of, and I'm going through this, um, guidelines, for you guys starting out where you're going and what you want to be doing in the future, um, and what advice I would give to you now. Your grades are important, but your grades are already there because to get to each level, your grades have to be met at certain um, certain levels. So how, what's going to make you stand out when you go and apply to all of these different sets? What do you think you need? Depending on the type of areas you want to go into, and particularly stuff like family law, start doing internships, start getting published, find an area of family law that you really quite like and get published on it. Um, also, legal advice centers are really good. So I teach five commercial solicitor firms family law. And what that means then is that they can go off to the law centers and then give pro bono legal <coughs> advice. Get involved in some of that stuff because everyone's going to have really good grades. It's just now a matter of what's going to make you stand out. And if family law is an area that particularly you want to be involved in, then let's show off with your family um, family law CV and um, also London is such a great city it has so many opportunities and you're so lucky to be living in it and be able to do these like various internships and stuff and particularly in terms of international family law if that's an area I would definitely try and get involved in some of the NGOs and um, the internships anything like that that's going to make you stand out um, over to you Thank you. <laughs> um, and the uh, real googly that is about to be thrown to you in this last session of the day, and I hope you've had a busy day and I hope you have all been talking, and if you have been talking as much as I've been talking, I hope you are as exhausted as I potentially might be by midnight tonight, but not there yet. Uh, the googly I'm about to throw you is I don't practice in family law. But the theme um, that I will... Um, expand upon is how different areas of law overlap um, and they do indeed. I already told you my name is Lachlan Wilson. I practice at Three Paper Buildings, um, otherwise known as Three PP Barristers, where a crime, but mainly Western Circuit crime, but pr principally a common law set. Um, we do uh, have uh, aspects of commercial law. I don't touch it with a barge pole because I much prefer people law and so do you too because that's why you're here and in this room. My main areas of practice are education law, employment law and professional disciplinary. Um, I have a public law regulatory practice purely in the professional disciplinary fields. As far as education law is concerned, the principal areas of practice there are looking at children with special educational needs. And of course, because I've now mentioned that magic word children, you now see how areas of law will overlap. It will be very rare that you will find a family that is not in trouble who has children particularly children on the autistic spectrum disorder behaving, uh, uh, displaying all sorts of behavioural difficulties that does not also have family difficulties as well. And quite often you'll find those um, uh, particular challenges will uh, come from uh, different forms of dispute. I am constantly liaising with my family law colleagues in chambers uh, because they will be telling me, I've sorted out the family law aspects, but there's still the uh, children uh, uh, to uh, cater for. We've heard mention of um, uh, children in care. Looked after children are significantly a higher proportion of children with special educational needs, for obvious reasons. 
So my special educational needs practice takes me principally in the first tier tribunal, the Special Educational Needs and Disability Tribunal, and the aim is to make sure that those children with needs that require special educational provision to be made for them, the aim is to have that provision made for them. I also practice in employment law. And if I were to give myself a pound for every time I have been told in the employment tribunal by my clients that it's amazing, it was like a small family together, but then it broke up. And I even had a case in the employment tribunal where the claimant was the godfather of the managing director of the respondent company. Of the godfather, it was the godfather to the child, of the managing director of the respondent company, and the managing director of the respondent company denied it, and said he wasn't the godfather, <laughs> and he even pointed to the fact that he couldn't have been the godfather. I'm a Catholic and he's a Muslim. How can he be a godfather? He said, and so the next day we came with the photographs of the my client, the claimant, at the altar holding the baby <laughs> at, um, at the uh, baptism. Um, and so employment law has often been described as a kind of family law with no um, uh, uh, mistake. Most people spend more time with their colleagues than they do with their spouses. Um, uh, uh, so it is a family law. And of course, I've told you about my professional disciplinary area of practice. That's an area of practice that deals with all those professional bodies that have a code of practice which regulates them, and should they find themselves falling foul of their regulator, uh, they need uh, uh, support and representation. So for example, the Nursing and Midwifery Council, the General Medical Council, the General Dental Council, the General Chiropractic Council, the Healthcare Professions Council, and the Association of Accounting Technicians, even. Um, all have uh, codes of practice that require regulation. I either represent or I sit as a legal assessor, which you're entitled to do as a qualified barrister, to ensure that fair process and due process is observed. Because, of course, it's slightly different to uh, a, a standard employment law disciplinary process where somebody may be dismissed because of the reasonable um, uh, belief of the employer at the time. In the professional sphere, being dismissed from one profession can have tremendous ramifications for the ability to get a job within the profession anywhere else. And so uh, uh, fair and due process is so important in those uh, 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 types of hearings. What is the common theme? I've already said my area of practice trespasses on family law. It does indeed. And the common theme, I think, certainly in my areas of practice, is the behavior and conduct of people. I didn't mention it, but the other area of my education practice is to deal with excluded children, which, of course, is all about behavior and about tolerating behavior. So it's conduct and behavior of people. And, and, and I say, if you are remotely interested in family law, if you're remotely interested in a people-based law, that is what drives you. That is what uh, uh, you are concerned about. You are not accountants if you are into family law, although you do have to deal with some difficult pension and um, ancillary relief uh, uh, financial applications, but uh, you rely on your es experts for that. What drives you um, in family, in education, in employment, in professional disciplinary is the way people behave and conduct themselves. Now, you will forgive me because I'm about to give you another slogan um, which is not a legal one at all. But what drives your practice and your success in dealing with people's behaviours? Particularly when you have your employment law client in conference sitting opposite you and you want to bury your head, or dare I suggest hashtag facepalm, because of what your client is telling you. The most important thing that you can do is respect your client's dignity. 
and that is your claimant client or your managing director of the small or medium enterprise that you're representing, your respondent client, it does not matter. So what rides above this behavior and conduct of people is dignity as the slogan. Because if you preserve that, it will also make you behave as professionals with your opponent, with of course what you are required to have anyway and you're obliged to have under your code of practice as a barrister, It'll make you behave with courtesy. So there you are. There are some themes that I have uh, given you. Um, if you respect dignity, you can negotiate with your opponent for an outlet that will preserve dignity on both sides. And if your reasonable settlement is not accepted, well then, of course, you fight for the best you can for your client but always remembering that the tribunal or the court that is listening to your claim will want to know that you are still respecting dignity there as well, will want to know that what you are arguing for is not beyond reasonableness. Now you all know about the reasonable man. You all know about the concept of reasonableness in the law. I'm not going to take you through any academic analysis but it drives home exactly how people behave and it drives home how you act as practitioners in this people field. Right, you're all here today and looking around and you will not mind me saying so, you are all very young. Pardon the condescension from this side of the table, you will believe. You're embarking on a legal career and you've come here today because, and I hope you have discussed with the various um, uh, stands and exhibitors uh, within the hall, I hope you have discussed how best to embark on the next stage of your legal career. And each of you will have very different journeys. You understand when I say young, I use the term loosely. And you understand when I talk about journeys, I lose the term loosely. Some of you will get pupillage first time round. Some of you will not get pupillage first time round. And you must not beat up on yourself because you have not. The numbers game you are facing, our chambers particularly, have 400 applicants for this past year, the three pupillages we were offering. We actually interviewed 47 at first round, which is a phenomenal amount of first round interviews from 400 applicants. We probably won't be able to do that next year. We will probably be able to do only half of that for first round interviews next year. What is going to get you into that interview? That is what you really need to know. What is going to make you stand out? Well, I can tell you, and we've heard um, uh, uh, some uh, 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 useful um, advice, certainly about publishing, because actually that taps into really what I think needs to stand out. Your application form needs to, to the interviewer, say, uh, to the person sifting, not the interviewer, to the person sifting your application form. That's interesting. I want to hear more about that. I want to hear more about that at interview. And so you need to stand out. Publishing, engaging in publications, excellent. For those of you that are not blessed with years of experience, because you are approaching it from what I may call, and not derisively at all, a conventional route of school, university, law school, and then the application, you are going to need to stand out against those who come from a wealth of experience because they are blessed with years beyond where you're at. And so how you stand out is you identify what your passion, you will forgive me for using a classical term, pothos, what your desire is in dealing specifically with people law. What drives you? The end game is not to be a barrister. That is not an end game. It's not even a means to an end. The end game is what actually drives you to want to indulge in other people's behaviours, engage with other people's behaviours, and sort out uh, their problems. That must be what drives you, and that must be what your application form identifies you as the person to be. 
Now for those that are young and don't have sufficient experience, I say this, I know you will have friends and family, unless you're very weird, and they will, having heard that you've embarked upon a legal career, get you on the phone any time of day or night with their problems. And they will say, my boss is behaving like this to me. How can I sue the pants off him? Or whatever. Words to that effect. And actually, those experiences are equally valuable, provided you can summarize them in a few words as to how you may have assisted and how you may have dealt with them. When it comes to the interview, what I want to hear is also how you kept those members of the family at an arm's length and said, sorry, I can't be involved in that because. And I'll want to hear that as well. But don't um, neglect the fact that you as uh, budding practitioners will already have assisted members of the family, will have assisted friends, and you'll have assisted them practically and hopefully academic research as well. And that is something that you can add on your application form. Because what I want to see when I preside, and I do not um, manage 3PB's recruitment process, but I do sit on first round interviews, I do obviously want to see academic uh, ability. I do not have any shame in telling you that 20 years ago, my 2-2 from Oxford got me seven pupillage offers. You are in a different era. Not even a 2-2 from Oxford is going to get you a pupillage offer because you are in a different numbers game. So you need your 2-1 or above, and you need and uh, what's been suggested. You've got that academic qualification. Don't get me wrong, my chambers also wants to know mitigation because we are human, and we know that humans entertain all sorts of adversity in their lives. So if you've got that 2-2, don't let that bar you from applying to chambers, but let's see the mitigation as to why you've got that 2-2. But otherwise, it's 2-1 or above, but you've got that. Of course you've got muting experience. You will have muting experience. Muting experience to me is an artificial academic exercise. It shows you that you've got the academic ability. What I want to see is I want to see practical experience. The advice centers that have been mentioned. I want to see that you've rolled your sleeves up, that you actually identify what the whole purpose of being a barrister is about, which isn't the vanity attached to the role, which is actually sorting out other people's problems. And that's uh, what I want to hear, and I want to see that you've engaged practically in doing it. It's not an academic exercise, it's a practical exercise. Free representation unit, obviously. But don't just apply, don't just be taken on. Push for that first hearing, whether it's the Social Security Appeals or whether it's the Employment Tribunal. Push for that first hearing. Make sure you've got that under your belt. Those early forms of advocacy where you are genuinely sorting out somebody's problem will show that you have what it takes to not hashtag facepalm when your client gives you a complete googly in conference, but to resolve the issue and get the best result in the circumstances. And now, putting on my former school teaching hat, I'm now going to throw it open to you, and I want you to say what is burning uh, on your mind <laughs> and what questions you have um, uh, that uh, the collective brains that we may have at uh, the best part of quarter to four on a Saturday afternoon. Quarter to three, that clock's wrong, surely. Yes, quarter to three um, on a Saturday afternoon uh, can provide for you. So do pipe up. And also, you, um, it's a collective experience, so pipe up with your experiences as well, and where you are. Um, when you speak, and I can see Gig um, uh, uh, putting her hand up, um, when you speak, uh, do say your name um, and just where you're at, uh, final year or BPTC or whatever, just say where you're at. Yes? Hello, my name is Caroline Akinyeli. Hello, I'm Caroline. Going to be, hello. I'm going to be starting the BPTC in September. 2017. The question I have for the both of you is that 
I know a lot of people, especially outside of the law, find the law quite drag and boring sometimes. But as we're all here, we obviously find it very interesting. I wanted to know what the most fun thing you think you've done in your legal career so far? Um, well, actually, I really like the law. Um, I love it, actually. So um, this is going to sound really pathetic, but I actually enjoy every day at the bar. Um, one of the most exciting things I've done in my career is I used to work for the Innocence Project in the US. And for those who don't know what that is, it's where you get prisoners from the US contacting you um, to say that they didn't do it, that they are innocent. And what we would do is then we would go in and look at the evidence for and retest it for DNA. And DNA testing has come on hugely in the last um, 20, 30 years. And we would find that the DNA on the crime scene points to somebody else. So we'd get a new trial for those people. So that was one of the most exciting things I've done. But as I said, it's just different areas. Get out there and experience this. If, you, if these opportunities come up, do them. If they come up internationally, do them. Just get out there because you never know what experiences are going to then you know, spring you to the next step or you decide on other different areas that you want to get into. Your turn. <laughs> <coughs> Having suggested that I'm actually a touchy-feely kind of guy, I'm now going to tell you the other side to me because I actually do think the, for me, the most fun aspect of being a barrister, and this is very distinct from the role of a solicitor, is having your witness in cross-examination answering the questions that you have absolutely led them down the path to answer. So, that touchy-feely person who suggested for one minute that law was all about resolving disputes is now saying, actually, the funnest <laughs> part is actually getting your witness in cross-examination um, to give you what you want for your client. And I do that, that is the fun part, and it is a tremendous privilege and you have to observe that privilege. And do not forget what I said about dignity and courtesy, because you can't do that aggressively. You can't do that antagonistically. The best compliment I was paid by one of my pu former pupils was, I say best compliment, it's both the best compliment and the worst compliment, was that he studied various members of Chambers's form of advocacy and he says your advocacy in cross-examination when you're cross-examining the witness is you approach the witness as though he were your very best friend that you had not seen for some considerable time. And it's almost like in cross-examining that witness you are giving them a very great big hug, but you are twisting a knife in their back as you are hugging them and they do not even realize it um, and they don't appreciate it. Now, so now I have seriously worried you about the extent of the touchy feeliness. Um, but um, if you're doing that, you understand for your client, you are doing it with observing the principles of courtesy and dignity at every stage. Um, you will be told differently on the bar course as to whether you always begin your cross-examination with good morning, Miss Sanso, or good afternoon, Miss Sanso. I will tell you now, I always begin my cross-examination with good morning and good afternoon. I always begin with a civility because that is... Um, uh, uh, I believe uh, what you're there for. You're there to observe civility in achieving um, the role you want. And just by way of example, um, one of the, because the question was actually really about fun, and I quite liked that. I quite <laughs> liked that element, um, uh, the fun element. One of the funniest elements was a, uh, uh, acting for a respondent in the employment tribunal, a respondent uh, firm, small business, very small business, uh, marketing and publishing company, principally run uh, by uh, the entire board of directors were women. And the male claimant was bringing a sex discrimination claim um, on the basis that he felt he had been uh, unjustly treated because he was a man. Um, and one of the things that he said was, and he pointed to, um, uh, uh, a, a communication, it was an email communication, uh, which said something along the lines of, God help us um, uh, 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 to succeed on this particular occasion, brackets, if she wants to, close brackets. And of course, you do this, you have a play when you're um, uh, cross-examining, it's very dangerous, because of course you've all been told you never cross-examine 
Uh, you never ask a question in cross-examination that you don't know the answer to. But just occasionally, you know roughly, going back to people behaviour, you know roughly how people are going to behave. So I asked him, well, why does that show discrimination? And of course he said, well, look, here it says, it's suggesting God is female. And everybody knows God's a man. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. I wasn't allowed to um, uh, cross-examine further on the um, uh, theology um, of whatever religious book uh, he uh, 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 subscribed to. Uh, but it was brilliant because it highlighted the intrinsic discrimination of the claimant um, uh, um, uh, for himself. But there you are. The funnest part is cross-examination <laughs> when it goes right. I have to say, the corollary to that is the most horrible part is cross-examination when it goes wrong. Yeah. When the witness is so brilliant that he's not going down the route you want the witness to go and is destroying your client's case. And then the best advice I can give to you is sit down. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Anybody else? Burning questions? Yes, I'll come to you. Hi, um, Mohammed, I'm the final year student. Um, Hello, Mohammed. Leading on from the previous question, do you find that you have time for outside interests? Um, if so, do you have it? <laughs> <laughs> Shall I go first to give you to give you some time to think? Um, there is there is um, like any profession, and certainly any profession uh, that you embark upon um, uh, when you have youthful vigour. You understand when I talk about young and I talk about youth, it's anything under the age of sixty. Okay, when you have youthful vigour, um, uh, you are encouraged to work hard and play hard, um, and the bar does encourage that. Within Chambers we have a particular pothos, that's the Alexandrian desire, okay, um, for karaoke. Um, and we, <laughs> we engage in karaoke in a big way. But my home is in Scotland and I have a small holding in Scotland and I get up there and I ride my horse and I mend fences in the field, and I hang gates in the field, and I do other things as well. Um, it is so important to do other things, yes. Um, uh, look, I, I'm, I don't preside over those commercial contracts that the fresh fields of this world will keep their um, uh, workers such as they are um, showering by day and night 24-7 in the workplace, but I have to say, I think that is a very unhealthy way to live. And I don't do that, and I deliberately don't do that. And that is the beauty of the bar. You can, to a certain extent, dictate how much work takes over your life. But don't get me wrong, work taking over your life is not necessarily a bad thing. When I am riding my horse, I am thinking about the next case. When I am walking my dog, I am thinking about the next case. Um, so. And, and, and that doesn't distress me and shouldn't distress you. It shouldn't distress you to be constantly thinking about your work. But when it takes over your life so that you can't even go out and sing Bye Bye Miss American Pie at the end of an evening with your colleagues, um, <laughs> then I think and I fear <laughs> that you're maybe letting it take over. There is time. There is always time because you make time. <laughs> Um, do we have any fun at the bar? Do we have anything outside at the bar? What do you think? <laughs> 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 the bar is really, really good fun. Um, there's always amazing stuff going on in terms of extracurricular activities. Our chambers is always arranging um, different events or sponsoring different events, which is great. Um, at the moment, I'm organising with several other people a uh, ski trip. We're going to um, Geneva, well, somewhere near Geneva. Um, I, I'm a ski instructor, so I used to do a lot of that beforehand. Um, and also you won't like my snowplow, then. <laughs> no, I'll teach you the pizza. <laughs> that sounds interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Behave. Okay. 
<laughs> and then also the bar organises um, tennis clubs and cricket clubs and things like that. So the bar is really good place. It's a really fun place and there's lots of different things to be involved in. And that's just, we've only really mentioned the sports and stuff like that. So. Can, can, can I just say one of the reasons why the bar is a genu genuinely fun place is actually you tend not to work with your colleagues in chambers. Now you do if you're on a big case and you're being led by so-and-so in chambers and you're one of the juniors or the other way around I've got next week, you're leading in a, in, in a case. Um, so, so then you do work, but you're working with one or two. If it's a really big case, three members of chambers, but very rarely otherwise. So in fact, your chambers community, you only ever see socially. Mm. Uh, and because you only ever see them socially, you only ever have a good time with them. Um, but but you were, your question was really about whether it gives you time for anything else. You decide. If you are a workaholic, then by all means, work 24-7. You decide. But, um, yes, it, it does give you if you want it. Yes. My name's Chris, and I've Hello, Chris. been three years an MA student and 20 years a social worker. Excellent. Now, I know. I'm sorry. I take my hat off to you. Um, my question is that um, we've been discussing playing to our strengths, but also looking at various different related areas of the, um, of the practice. Um, my obvious strength is children, families, social work with the local authority, but my secret hankering is to do professional regulatory work with social workers, and I know that sounds a little bit weird, but I was wondering to what extent that letting that slip of people's interview might be dangerous. Not dangerous at all. Absolutely not dangerous. But when you say letting it slip, don't let it slip to the detriment of the other experience you've got. Because the other experience that you've got um, will stand you in good stead for those chambers that deal with an awful lot of care work. Uh, and so you want to keep that experience going because you can give a uh, wonderfully experienced insight into it. Uh, but no, entirely understandable that also, having embarked upon that, um, uh, you uh, see a, a, a very discreet area about the uh, regulatory, uh, the regulation of the conduct of those uh, professionals in their field. Um, no, let them both come out. And it's not letting it slip at all. It is actually projecting both of them. They are both um, uh, valid experiences or valid um, uh, things that you wish to embark upon. Definitely. Yes? Um, my name's Alana and I'm working as a paralegal. Um, I was wondering how can pupils contribute to getting in business for Chambers? Um, they can always contribute for getting business into chambers. I mean, that's the edge I was talking to you about earlier. Um, I mean, if you want to bring, um, make the introductions, fine. But also, I mean, we all as barristers bring work into our chambers in any event, as well as having our clerks. So, I mean, there's hundreds of ways you can contribute to chambers. Can I, can I answer it this way, which is how I... Um use my pupils and by use I don't mean abuse because obviously this is being filmed and will find itself in front of the bar standards board um, uh, otherwise um, my pupils come with me to the seminars that we give as a chambers to our professional and lay clients and they come and they do exactly what I do which is they press the flesh they talk they engage and the reason why they're doing that actually is because six months down the line they're wanting to receive their first brief uh, from these people. So in a sense pupils contribute to chambers in exactly the same way that members of chambers contribute to chambers um, and I certainly encourage that. Um, if you were trespassing along the line of would chambers select pupils on um, a pupillage application process because they were to come to their pupillage interview and say, and I can bring this list of solicitors to chambers, which will bring so much work in. Well, I have to say you're, treat, uh, you're talking to cynical counsel who treats that with a massive dose of salt. Um, so do not uh, fear for one minute that uh, somebody who says that they can um, bring jam 
uh, uh, today um, uh, because uh, uh, if we give them their pupillage, uh, that they'll be given their pupillage. No. They'll be given their pupillage because they show personally the skills and aptitude that will make them successful barristers, even if their source or alleged source of work were not to be there. That is how we do it in James. All right? I think you may have listened to the I mean, like, in what ways? So how can people volunteer extra time? To ah, now be careful about extra time. It's better, better well known. Yeah. No, 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 I, I, I can, yes. Do, 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 have you got anything else to say? or? I've always got plenty to say. <laughs> yeah, me too. That's the problem with barristers. They've always got lots to say. No, I think um, pupils can always contribute to um, chambers. Um, for example, our family law team is very active. Um, there's lots of people on Sky News giving commentary, getting published, attending the seminars. Um, I mean, there's so many things that people can do, and Chambers love that. Um, and it's lovely to get the name out there. I mean, pupils get just as much opportunities to do that as um, barristers. And generally, it's whatever you want to do. I mean, if you have this like edge of something that is like really a nice area that you like, and probably lots of members of Chambers don't have that, then you know, flourish in that area and be, you know, you know, do it yourself. That's the thing about the bar. You're allowed to go out there and get areas of work yourself or develop niche areas, and most chambers will, will you know, support you on that. Let, let, let me also make this clear, because it, it, it sounds like you might think pupils will feel pressurised to do it, to work beyond 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, or whatever it is, in order to um, uh, do something more for chambers. Um, uh, the, the way we deal with it in 3PB is pupils are very much, when we go on our joint marketing exercise, members of chambers. Um, and they are very much part and parcel of being part of that uh, projection of chambers. So that's how they can do it, and that's how they will do it best. But they mustn't feel, um, I have spoken to, I know some of you uh, in this room, but certainly to many people today, about this condition called pupil paranoia. They mustn't feel obliged to work beyond a certain time um, or to um, uh, give up their weekends in order to feel like they are doing their best thing. Um, uh, that is a... Uh, certainly we in Chambers are very conscious that pupillage is a state of limbo, it's a state of being a member of Chambers and at the same time not being a member of Chambers. Um, and uh, going through pupillage, there are all sorts of pressures. We as a chambers are acutely aware of um, uh, mental health issues. Well, I am uh, particularly because of my practice. Um, there are all sorts of issues with uh, uh, pupils feeling like um, they have done something wrong because someone passes them by on the stairwell or in the corridor and doesn't even acknowledge their existence. And the reason for that is because they feel like they are being assessed on a daily basis. and you're not as pupils, okay? The assessment times come when it is obvious assessment time. The piece of work you turn around for a member of chambers, that's obviously assessment. You're not being assessed because you um, might have turned up to work one day um, uh, uh, wearing uh, uh, um, uh, a particular style of clothing. You're not being assessed on that. Certainly not in our chambers. You are only assessed at the obvious times of assessment when you turn in work, obviously that will be subject to assessment. When you do our pupillage assessment exercises, we do an advocacy um, exercise uh, within chambers. Obviously you're being assessed for that. But so often it is the case that um, during pupillage, you feel like you're being assessed every second of the day. The train is 10 minutes late, you get in and you want to apologize 50,000 times. Well, you shouldn't need to, because the number of barristers who turn up late because of our woefully inadequate train system, um, it happens. Okay? You're not assessed all the time. You had a question? My name is Lydia. I'm my final year of the LLB. And um, my question is um, mostly regarding how valuable is the experience brought in from a different jurisdiction, legal experience? Um, Interesting. Um, 
It's in, uh, particularly interesting because on Tuesday I am um, meeting a Belgian qualified, um, why did I say Belgian? Brazilian qualified lawyer um, uh, who is coming um, uh, uh, to this country and wants to start out in law in this country. The answer is, it will give you the general experiences because most legal systems are not that different. At the end of the day, the legal systems that exist are there to deal with the population and how um, we regulate the problems and the issues that they have. So it'll, it'll, the experience will be interesting. What is incumbent on you, or whoever has, the um, uh, additional experience is to identify those headers of experience that will be of interest to the set that you may be applying for. So the fact that you may be experienced in a different jurisdiction tells me nothing. I want to know what areas of law you were. Labour law, for example, is across the board. There is employment law in most countries. Um, and, and, and I want to know what that experience has given you in practical terms. It doesn't matter whether it's from a different jurisdiction, but the fact that you've got it is a bonus. It's always a bonus. I'm referring to Scotland. Ah, so even better. <laughs> well, um, sorry, go on. Sorry, the, the other question was regarding with um, is knowledge of second, third, fourth language valuable? Um, knowledge of uh, what experience in different industries, how valuable is that? Depends where you're applying for. Well, also, though, um, I started my practice in New York. Um, I also worked in Wisconsin, and then I was five years at the Bar of Ireland before I came here, and I'm three years here. So what do you think my answer is going to be about experience in another Yeah, don't bother doing it. <laughs> oh, no, it's not, is it? <laughs> so I think it's so valuable, and chambers love that. All chambers love that because you bring a whole different dimension to the chambers or an area of law. So, for example, your languages... Um, are going to be fantastic when dealing with extradition clients, for example, because none of them are English. Um, you know, er, any area. Family law is the same across the board as um, Lachlan was talking about labour. It's the same, it's the same principles and it's the same skill set you use to manage people. I mean, it's, it's only going to be positive. I can't see any downside.